I learn a lot from my nieces and nephews. They feature regularly enough in my homilies. But I was just remembering one particular situation there not so long ago uh, where uh, my two nieces and nephew were there with my, my brother and sister-in-law. And my sister-in-law asked them to, to clean up after themselves, right? So they're, oh, Janie, what ages are they now? Oh, why do I, why do, I do this to myself? Uh, five, four and a bit? No, has to be less than four. Well, four-ish. Five, four and two and a bit, half-ish thing. Um, so they asked them to clean up after themselves, right? And you just got the, do we have to? And then you kind of, you know, they pick up the fork and they kind of, drag the fork the whole way to the kitchen, put it on the stupid fork, and then kind of back into the cave, grab the plane, and the food falling everywhere. And <laughs> do I have to clean it up? And, do I, and then I go to bed, it's time to go to bed. Oh, do I have to go to bed? Or put on my pajamas, do I have to put on my pajamas? Put on your slippers, do I have to put on my slippers? And everything is, do I have to, right? Do I have to? And it's interesting how it, it, it's, it's um, a thing that we, we, we pick up as children, I suppose, like, you know, what's the minimum? <laughs> what's the minimum I have to do? Like, can I go to sleep just in my clothes? Do you know what I mean? Do I have to actually change? Do I have to actually shower? I mean, can I stretch it to four days, five, five days between showers? Do, I, do, I, do you know what I mean? What will actually happen? You know what I mean? So we, it's, it's, this, it's, this, it's an interesting thing that we, we develop as, as kids, uh, what's the minimum we have to do to get by? I, mean, I don't know, our time is precious when we're young. I mean, there's, there are trees to be climbed. Um, whatever else, we, there are pillow fights to be had. Um, so we don't want to be wasting our time. So we start identifying very quickly, what's the minimum I have to do, right? What's the minimum? What do, do I have to do all these other things? Now, as adults, that actually creeps a little more into our lives, I think, than we're, than we're aware of. Do you know, uh, like, do, do I have to... Do, do I have to pray? Like, do I have to? You know what I mean? I go to mass, and do I have to really do more than that? Or, like, you know, I fast twice a year. You know, on, on Ash Wednesday. I've been even on Ash Wednesday. Do I have to kind of, you know, fully kind of, you know, do the whole? Do I have to actually feel hungry? Do I have? And very, very quickly, we begin to just pull from our lives anything that might be considered uncomfortable, right? And our spirituality and our, our life with the Lord becomes just, we try to make it as easy as possible, as unintrusive on our freedom as possible. This is a sure and certain way of guaranteeing that you will never become a saint. Absolutely guaranteed. If we're always looking for the easy way out and for the, do I actually have to in our spiritual lives, you will never be a saint. Never. Because you'll always choose the easy way, you'll always choose the path of least resistance, you'll always choose the path of mediocrity, and that's anything but sanctity. Sanctity is perfection, not mediocrity. So in our, in our spiritual lives, and, and therefore in our ordinary lives, this do I have to attitude is absolutely disastrous. You know, so anytime we're held to a standard, and we're kind of, do I have to, like, do I have to, kind of drop, always drop short, I mean, and then if someone points it out, it's their fault for pointing it out as opposed to, maybe I just didn't do my work. Maybe I was too lazy. Maybe I was too proud to, to, to accept correction. Grand, it's, it's your choice, it's your life, you'll never be a saint. You, I mean, name a saint that lived like that, you know? So the way we live our ordinary lives, the way we live our ordinary tasks, has everything to do with sanctity, has everything to do with becoming a saint. You remember in, in my seminary as well, there were, there were some lads, I mean, well-intentioned lads, uh, and always in the first year, we're always full of zeal, and whatever the superior says, yes, absolutely, we'll, you know, uh, we had a, 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 what do we call it, a, a day of renouncement kind of thing, where we, we brought down and placed in front of the altar all the things that we were going to give up, right? Uh, and I remember Father Paul, my founder, he was there for that day, and he was actually shocked at all the stuff that he saw, because like there were just, you know, stacks of, all sorts of music CDs that weren't maybe so, not, not nothing satanic like, but just, you know, music CDs that maybe like aren't so appropriate in, in, in a seminary, you know. I had all of my Beats albums <laughs> anyway, and then a couple of stacks of cigarettes there as well for the pop. Oh, really? <laughs> who owns that? He said, who owns? And then he said, no, actually I won't ask. Uh, so, 
Yeah, and the, the, these days, you know, and especially for, for us as first years, we'd always go gung-ho for that kind of thing. You know what I mean, like, I'm going to cut this stuff out of my life. Grant, by second year, you're like, do I have to, though? What do you mean? Like, I mean, if I listen to the occasional kind of, <coughs> what's the problem like? I said, well, I can still be, I can still be a priest, can't I? You know what I mean? And then little by little, you start just kind of clawing the stuff back. And none of it's really sinful, is it? It's not like, it's not, it's just, but they're just compromises, like, just the easy way out, the path of least resistance. And then you notice by third year or fourth year, then the lads who, who were unable to give stuff up invariably left. You know, by, three, by year three or year four, you know, like those who kind of were constantly looking for com comforts and the easy way out, they didn't make it, like, they didn't make it through. So this is, this is how sanctity works in, in reality in real life, because I think we can kind of mysticize it a bit and think it's all about mystical experiences and levitations, and it's not. It's about doing the dishes. It's about praying. It's about turning up on time. It's about loving your neighbor. It's about, you know, elevating the other, lifting the other up. It's about God, putting God in the first place and doing everything, the ordinary things, out of love for him. That's sanctity. So when we talk about all the saints of Ireland here, like, you know, we do love the, 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 the epic stories of Saint, your St. Saint Patrick's and St. Bridget's and cloaks um, miraculously growing and spreading and covering acres and all this. That, that's great, that's great. Uh, but let's never forget that all of those miracles were always preceded by years of selflessness and prayer and service and love for the Lord. It wasn't those miracles that made them saints. They were saints before those miracles happened. So our lives then are made up of these ordinary experiences, these ordinary challenges. I was thinking today of, you know, what saints should be, should, could we look at today, like all saints of Ireland. And the one that really struck, out, struck me was, uh, was Matt Talbot, right? Again, probably because he's a bit closer to our time. And I love, I love those stories of, of people who kind of messed up and then got things right, because it reminds me of me. Um, I, find, I find that a little easier to relate to. You know, so we've got Matt Talbot, born in 1856, and uh, in Dublin, and uh, one of 12 children, only six of whom lived to adulthood. That was probably common back in the day. I mean, a lot of kids would have died, and yeah. So I mean, hard times, hard times, very, very difficult. Um, so one of of 12 kids had one year of schooling, couldn't read or write. Uh, at the age of 12, he goes to work in a place that would be detrimental to him. Uh, it was a, a company that bottled beer. So when the bottles would come back then from the pubs, uh, he would drink the dregs, the last little bits that were in the bottles and that had, so they'd been drunk out by, of, by other people and then whatever was left, otherwise known as the backwash, sorry, but there you go. Anyway, he'd, he'd drink it off. So from the age of like 13, 14, he's starting to drink regularly the leftovers. Uh, then he moved on to, to whiskey eventually, and yeah, by his, 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 in his teens, he became an alcoholic. So he'd blow his wages, and I mean, wages, not like they, they would have been huge, but the little wages he was getting anyway, he was blowing them on, on alcohol. So every evening in the tavern, buying rounds and getting drunk, going home drunk, and you can imagine his mom then, you know, who, just lost, who had lost six children over the last, whatever it was, 15, 20 years, um, you know, like just hard times, and then you bring home nothing. And then you can imagine the, the the worry of the mother and the other siblings, like and just looking at this guy wasting his life. But that's that's what he did all day, every day, all day, every day for years until I think he was twenty eight, and uh, he had been begging, borrowing, and stealing to get more money for drink. Uh, it's reported also that he stole a blind man's fiddle. So there's some busker on the street, you know, uh, playing for, for money and <laughs> takes his fiddle and, uh, and sells it. You know, just anything and everything, just to get more money, to get more drink. And that was, that was his day, that was his life, that was his everything, right? Uh, people, other people had ambitions to become the boss of the company or who knows what. Uh, his ambition, I just want more drink. So that was his, his sole goal. So, one day then, at the age of about 28, 
uh, he had blown all of his money and he's standing outside the tavern saying, look, I've been coming here for more than 10 years, day in, day out. I've bought everyone in this pub more drink than I could count. Uh, so surely, it'll be no bother. I'll stand at the door, I've no money, but like someone will bring me in, someone will take care of me. And so he stood there and he was looking at his friends going in one by one and some ignored him and some said, no, nah, not, not today, not today, Matt, not today. And uh, they left him outside. And it was an interesting experience. One of the, it mightn't seem like much to us, you know, but to him, this was, this was a severe blow. These are the guys like, I'm spending all my days with. These are the guys I'm kind of blowing all my money with. And not one of them would buy me a drink. What am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? It just cut him to the core. So he, he, he walked home and his mom saw him early, you know, coming home before lunch, sober-ish. Uh, and she says to him, what are, you, what are you doing? Did something happen? And he says, no. But I want to stop drinking. Now, for those who are Irish, we understand this concept of taking the pledge. For those of you who are watching who may not be Irish, uh, it's a common thing when we get our confirmation to, to take the pledge, which is a, a, a promise made in front of a priest that you won't drink alcohol until you're 18, or you can take it afterwards as well for a certain period of time. It's a promise not to, not to take alcohol for three months, six months, a year, life, whatever it may be. So he said to his mom, Ma, as he would have said, Ma, I'm going to take the pledge. And the mom thought, that's, that's lovely. Not going to happen. You know, this is, just keep in mind that this is the anything but like the, the do I have to attitude. Did he have to? No, he didn't. But thanks to the isn't, it's about doing what you have to. It's about doing what you should. So she says, okay, look, um, we go to the priest and we'll see what we can do. So they went to the Jesuit church and uh, the priest thought, look, wonderful idea that you want to take the pledge. Maybe don't take it for life because you don't need, just, just like bite-sized chunks, okay? Take it for three months, see how it goes. So he takes the pledge for three months, promises not to drink. Now, if you've been drinking for 10 years straight and you suddenly stop go, going cold turkey, um, you'd have hallucinations and nausea and, you know, your system is just detoxifying. It's, it's a fairly rough patch. But he held on to it. And he started to put together a daily program for himself where he'd get up in the morning very early. He'd, get about, he'd go to bed about 1 o'clock in the morning, get up at about 5 and go to daily mass, which wasn't very common now. This is the early 20th century. That wouldn't have been very common back in the day to go to daily mass. So he gets up in the morning, goes to daily mass, and of course mass it was, it was in Latin then, so it was slightly, slightly longer, more time for preparation, spend, and then head off to work. Uh, he joined the Legion of Mary. He joined numerous different prayer groups, so he'd, he'd have something every evening to stop him going to the, to the taverns, to the pubs. And every evening he'd pray, and every day he'd pray, and every morning he'd pray, and every time he was at work, he'd work hard. So he got a job on the docks, and, and everyone said he was like a little horse, small little butty fella, but strong as an ox kind of a thing. So they, everyone admired his, his, just again, the ordinary things, the ordinary things of life, doing the ordinary things well. He worked hard, worked an honest uh, day's work, brought the wages home to his mother, you can imagine the relief on her, in her heart, seeing her, her, her son, who she had presumed was going to end up in the bottom of a river somewhere after a, a fight or an altercation or, like, it wasn't going well. So, he starts to turn his life around. He died then in 1925, and uh, when they were going to bury him in a pauper's grave, so the grave of a, of a poor man, because they, they weren't a wealthy family, uh, they discovered that he had had chains, three chains wrapped around his, his torso in reparation for his alcoholism. This is something to kind of remind himself, I'm not going back there. I've hurt people. I've hurt other people. I've disregarded the abilities that, that, that God gave me. And so I'm not necessarily recommending the practice, although if one of you want to try it, maybe you can let me know. Uh, but this it was something he decided to do to wrap these chains around himself as an act of penance. 
and then his, his fame grew and his, his reputation for sanctity. He's now venerable. God willing, he'll be, he'll be a saint one day, who knows, with the help of God. Uh, but I just, what I love about his life, though, is just how, how ordinary it is, how his sanctity is shown by doing the ordinary things with extraordinary love. Ordinary lives lived with extraordinary love. Not looking at life thinking, what, what, what do I do? Do I absolutely have to do these things? But should I do this? Is this what God is asking me to do? And then we'll find our standard is constantly being raised until one day with God's grace, only with God's grace, will we become saints. So we ask the good Lord today, as we remember all of our faithful departed in this month of November, all of those on our list in front of the altar, we pray that they too will enter the glory of God's kingdom as saints. We pray that our prayers may help them to accept God's mercy, to break the ties of addiction, as we remember Matt Talbot today, anything that holds them back, anything that prevents them from entering heaven. Lord Jesus, we ask you to heal those wounds, break those chains, and welcome them into your kingdom of everlasting happiness so that we may join with our psalmist as we pray. Happy the man who has placed his trust in the Lord. Amen.